Hey guys, Veronica here. Today I'd like to talk a little bit about how I navigate change and cope with it. So I chose this subject today because I'm moving again. And for anyone else out there who's like, what, you just moved three months ago? Uh, yeah, I'm right there with you. This was not my decision. So the family that I've been living and working with and filming this Eat Your Yard series at uh, their place has decided for a number of reasons that they're going to move to a tropical island. Now, I have no desire to move to a tropical island with them while I have been asked because the work that I feel compelled to do with my life requires that I'm in a place where I can grow the sort of seeds that I'm looking to select and save and share with other farmers and gardeners. So we're going our separate ways. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about how you manage change in these sorts of circumstances because while I have a lot of friends that I've talked with over the last three or four days since I found out, uh, this is like absolutely rapid fire right now. Um, I was told a few days ago and we were basically on a two weeks notice sort of situation and all of these friends that I've talked to in the last few days are like, hey, you know, you're really doing fine with this, like you're coping well. And I think the long and short of it is, is that I'm really not. But I'm good at putting on a brave face and like, okay, let's get a plan of attack. And this is not something that is inherent in me. This is not something that, um, that is like just a natural talent. It is something that I've worked really hard at so that I am able to effectively navigate various landscapes uh, no matter what comes at me. Because change sucks, right? Like we're just going to put that out there. Like most of the time we're whether we're choosing change or change is choosing us, uh, it's not comfortable. It's super uncomfortable, uh, sometimes painful. Like whether you're changing habits and routines and you're dealing with addiction or maybe you're taking on a new workout or various things are going to cause you um, physical and metaphysical pain to some extent, uh, or at least make you question, you know, like who you are in this world. But that aside, there are ways to process and deal with it so that you don't completely lose your mind. So since there's so much going on in the world right now, um, so much change is happening. There's environmental stuff and there's health stuff and there's um, human rights stuff. I just thought that it would be good to take a few minutes and talk about how I go about dealing with these sorts of things to maybe help someone else out there that's like just a little overwhelmed right now. So. It's really heartbreaking, I will say, first off, to be digging out. I've been digging out these plants um, that were all over the yard for the last day and a half or so just to put them in pots so I can get them rehomed with friends and people around the Bay Area because um, I don't want them dying. You know, they're just like you can see, they're just starting to flower and fruit and really take off. And there's no sense to leave them for dead if they can get good homes. Um, when I am faced with massive change like this, the first thing that I do is try to triage the situation. If it's not something that I'm working towards and deciding like, okay, I'm going to move on this date, but it's something where it's like, okay, we're all leaving in two weeks. Uh, triage is that first line of defense. Triage requires a pretty strong community that you can reach out to and talk to and explain the situation and feel out what's going on out there in the world and where you can join in. Now, uh, I could have avoided triage by moving to tropical paradise, but again, that doesn't align with my goals in my life. So it would have just been sort of sidestepping everything for the sake of comfort and ease, which is not what I'm about here right now. And I don't think is going to benefit a lot of people. So we're going to skip that uh, option here because the matter of fact at the end of the day and like very baseline on this conversation is that change is inevitable. Just like the sun's going to set behind me here in probably the next 20 minutes and as I've tried to shoot this several times now and just keep coming up with like all of the wrong things to say. Um, but just like the sun will set behind me, just like this will eventually, camera will eventually run, run out of batteries, change is inevitable. Like it's going to happen. And so when you're faced with change, I found that I have two choices and then most people have two choices. The first choice is that you can dig your heels in. You can say, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going. I don't want it. It sucks. Like, I hate this. And really make it a miserable experience for yourself and everyone around you. Um, and probably not get anywhere, to be honest. <laughs> like, change is still going to happen. Change is inevitable. Uh, the second option is that you can go, huh, okay, change is occurring. You can embrace that. You can um, 
you know, run through the gamut of feelings. I'm not saying that I'm sitting here and I'm like totally cool and comfortable and like, okay, let's just meditate our way through because while yes, I am trying to meditate my way through, um, I've also run the gamut of emotions. I've been angry and I've been sad and I've been frustrated and I've been at a total complete loss and I've been afraid and anxious and anything that you can imagine over the last few days, just processing the sudden, like literal uprooting change. Um, but in choosing the second option, you say, okay, yes, I'm accepting the change is happening and change is inevitable. You run through all those emotions and then you go to your toolbox, your toolbox in here and your toolbox in here and you go, okay, what tools do I have in my toolbox to help me cope with this change? And not only cope, but like effectively manage and navigate so that I can thrive wherever it leads me to. So if you don't have tools in your toolbox, we can work on that. Um, that's something that I've been working on for a very long time. I will say part of the reason that I feel like I'm qualified to talk about change is because I have done so much of it in the last half a decade. Um, truly, ever since I quit my corporate job, I was working at a Fortune 100, and this is like the backstory people ask for, so I'm just gonna use this as the opportunity to tell it. Um, so I used to have a corporate job in an office doing big data for a Fortune 100 company, and I quit that five years ago because I knew deep in my heart that I wanted to be a farmer. Now, I did not know what farming meant for me. I knew it wasn't driving a tractor around a thousand acres of corn, but I knew that I needed to be farming in some capacity. At this point in time, I had a really well-paying job that afforded me a fairly nice house at the top of a hill in Los Angeles with a thousand square feet of growing space that I filled with literally every herb and flower and vegetable and fruit that I could fit in there and was basically eating out of my backyard and throwing really fun dinner parties on my front terrace and it was from the outside looking in a really ideal work-life balance but from the inside looking out there was something missing because I was not waking up and doing work every single day that kept me motivated I was just doing work that was paying the bills. So I made the leap, the biggest, scariest change to date um, that I've ever made in my life thus far. <laughs> um, I made the leap to quit that job and venture off into the unknown. Now when I quit, I didn't have anything particularly lined up. So I kind of put feelers out saying that I wanted to travel. Um, if anything, you know, if anyone was anywhere that could accept me, like I would crash on couches and, you know, organize and clean and whatever in exchange for a place to sleep. And um, I got rid of 13 years of earthly possessions that I had accumulated while I was in LA, saved for whatever would fit in my little car, um, got rid of my house, got rid of my job, got rid of all of a million different really rare plants and moved back to my dad's house, which is like probably not what you want to hear or do um, when you're a young adult, you know? Like it's just, that seems a little bit crazy and a step backwards after you've gotten all these other pieces in place. But I knew that I needed to do something that allowed me to kind of sit and think and process and feel all of the things that I was facing because I was just burned out. Um, in that period of time in the moving, I got really fortunate and I was very lucky in the sense that uh, I had someone reach out and offer me a part-time job as a private chef, even though I had no culinary school experience, just solely based on cooking pictures from Instagram and Facebook. And then I had another friend who I had met through the LA food scene reach out and offer me a much larger garden space the following year um, at their farm in California so that I could practice growing at like a bigger scale. And so at that point I was like, okay, well I gave up all of these things for the unknown. And there was definitely moments of what if it's never that good, but I needed to know like, maybe it could be and not ask those what ifs um you know at the end of the line if i continue doing the same things without actually trying to do um to venture off into the unknown and to make those big changes so a lot of the changes i've made in my life were because i was presented with new information or stimuli that had me adjust course so yeah part of it was because i was lucky but part of it was because i was open and said yes when someone said, hey, can I give you some more information or can I you know, share something with you? Now, one of the biggest changes, and this is what I, like, I'm trying to get around to talking about here, um, one of the biggest changes 
that has completely changed my trajectory in life actually came from a Facebook conversation a couple years ago on a plant page when we were talking about soil. And this was with someone I didn't know that we were just like messaging back and forth. Didn't know her, didn't know what she was about. Um, around the same time, I was a few videos deep now on YouTube. And I started making the videos on YouTube as a source for friends and family who were asking me the same questions over and over. Um, and I got tired of typing out the answers, so I just wanted to send them a link. Uh, clearly that worked out okay because you guys are still here. so. Um, thanks for that. But anyway, uh, I was in this conversation about soil and about plant health and I basically was in this mindset that was like dump some more compost on it, it'll be fine. Like compost, compost, compost is the answer, just keep adding compost. And this woman spoke up and was like, you can really make your microbes lazy in your soil if you give them too much food. And that just got me like so red hot, man. <laughs> like, I was so upset that someone was challenging what I believe. Like this is a deeply held belief. I was doing, you know, this more natural farming than fertilizer and stuff. And it's like compost is not a bad thing. You can't have too much of a good thing. Um, and I basically told her as much. I was just like, you don't know what you're talking about. Like my plants are happy. And she started kind of pointing around, you know, like things to look for to see if my plants were really happy, but also um, provided some resources. So she took a step back and basically said things in such a kind way, um, pointing out my blind spots and going, you know, I really do think that like, you're welcome to believe and feel what you want to feel and believe, but I'm just trying to help you. I'm on your side. And this is what I know about this space. So here's some resources. And, you know, if they resonate with you, cool. And if they don't, like, no harm, no foul. They're just resources I have. So um, I, of course, clicked through because I was looking for a little more fuel for my fire, um, hoping to, you know, maybe do a, I gotcha, I found something that's wrong or, like, doesn't match up with what you were saying. Um, looking for that internet fight, you know, like so many people do in the comment section. And somewhere in the middle of all of this, I took a step back, like I read what she shared and I took a step back and I read it again. And I realized that she was right and that I was being resistant to change. And I was being mentally resistant to change, which was kind of a new phenomenon for me because most of my change that I encountered thus far required some mental capacity, but a lot of it was physical. So it was physically moving from point A to point B, um, physically doing this instead of that, but it wasn't thinking something different before doing it. So this was a new experience for me. And what she shared made a lot of sense. And that small conversation, that small interaction with a woman that I didn't know, who was patient and kind enough with me to continue sharing information even though I was being a total pain, um, has completely shaped the trajectory of what I'm doing now in the garden in terms of digging deeper into soil biology and figuring out what's the best way to help everyone who cares to listen to me um, support their plants and their ecology long term. And so everything from the cover crops that I'm doing to the various amendments that I'm using to, you know, not overdoing the top dressing with compost and whatnot is because someone questioned my beliefs. And if that doesn't sit well, let's keep going because discomfort is like my sweet spot right now. So um, those invitations sometimes do not land well because I think that we fear giving something up, right? So sometimes we're giving up, a lot of times we're giving up our ego. Like something about our ego is just like, no, I'm right, I wanna be right. These are my beliefs, don't challenge them. and that's a really dangerous space to exist in because that's a space where you don't learn. So there's a fear maybe that you're not going to get as much back. Like I've talked about with all of the things I gave up, um, you know, in a previous lifetime, essentially with my job and my house and all of those things in order to venture to the unknown, not knowing if I would get anything that was equal or greater than, um, that's scary. That's like, material possessions that we sort of quantify and qualify our lives by scary. And when it gets more esoteric and it gets more sort of cerebral, working in the ego space, working in 
um, you know, this sort of like ideals and ethics and value space, it's so much easier to choose fear instead of being open to new information. So uh, all of this is to say that I want to spend a minute or two talking about implicit racial bias and how it impacts us because it is really a big thing that has been on my mind now um, for more than a couple of weeks, but definitely hardcore for the last few weeks. That is part of the reason that I've been quiet. And I'm not here to, um, you know, change minds and change hearts. Like, I'd love if that's a side effect, but I am here to ask you and to invite you to look a little bit closer at what you're feeding your brain and see if there's not a better way to go about um, making sure that you're getting a really holistic vision of everything that's going on so that you have the proper fuel for your fire so that when change begins to occur, you can actually identify it and assess it and embrace it and have the right tools to interact with it and thrive in the face of change instead of digging your heels in and making your own life miserable when change is inevitable, right? So a couple of things, and I left myself notes on this part because I've tried to shoot this four times or 10 times and just bleh. Anyway, um, so a few things I've noticed that impact my own implicit racial bias as I've dug into this. One of the things that I was starting to pay attention to um, like a probably a month and a half ago now, but really in the last few weeks, was my media diet. What are the visual cues that I'm giving myself from all of the other content creators out there to say like, this is what exists in the world and this is a good snapshot of the world. And by and large, I'd say that most of my media diet looked really white. There's like not really another good way to put that. Um, it was people that look like me and people that talk like me and people that shared sort of similar ideas to some extent. Um, there's definitely outliers, but for the most part, I wasn't following a high diversity of people sharing ideas and thoughts and feelings. And I think that it's very difficult, even on a level where, you know, you're raised to be, um, to not be racist, maybe not raised to be anti-racist at that point, but definitely raised to like not see race or whatever. Um, but if you're not seeing it at all, then there's definitely some pitfalls that you can fall into in terms of not humanizing other people because you don't actually engage with them in any capacity. Uh, so really, you know, amping up the diversity on my feed, um, that was the first thing that I sought out to do. Now, this was actually more challenging than I expected it to be initially because the algorithm does not select for topic and diversity, the algorithm selects for things that you've liked that are similar. And so if everything that you've engaged with up to a certain point looks a certain way, you're going to get recommended a lot more of that. And it really did take me actively pursuing, you know, various hashtags, finding accounts that were like the ones that share other accounts and repost um, to start getting the algorithm to shift, to show me a wider diversity of people that I might want to follow. But I had to actively participate in creating that sort of world that I wanted to live in or that I want to live in rather than just being the sort of bystander caught in you know the whole like hubbub that's going on and acting like nothing is happening but everything is happening so I would definitely say pay attention to your media diet if you're looking to change you know the way that you engage with the world um, that is like a very simple very easy way to go about beginning to shift the conversation. Now, one of the things that has really struck me and that I think is worth mentioning in this, you know, idea of blinders on, um, blind spots, talking about that in that space is that I have been spending a lot of time lately learning about the history of the country I live in and the history of the United States and how, what it was founded on and the fact that it was founded on disparity and oppression um, is something that we all need to come to terms with. And it's a really hard pill to swallow. It is not the sort of change that anyone wants to see in their history books. You don't want to hear about how horrible your ancestors were. But I think that in order for us to move forward, in order for us to um, determine you know, what sort of reparations need to exist, um, to not even determine that. <laughs> determine that is the wrong word. And like, I'm definitely going to stumble through this part. Um, but in order to uh, 
help provide the reparations that are being asked of us, I think that it is important to understand that the implicit racial bias that we carry now, um, that can be seen across the media and across basically all professional landscape, um, and we can see it in schools, we can see it literally everywhere in this country, is uh, it's a byproduct of where we started as a country. And so it's, you know, it's something that we definitely have to address and it's something that we have to um, figure out how we're going to navigate moving forward so that we can begin to heal, begin to provide those reparations that are necessary. Um, another thing that I would ask as we continue moving through these changes, because uh, the change is just going to keep coming faster and more furious, guys. <laughs> like That is just the nature of what's going on in the world right now. And so by mentally preparing ourselves to deal, we can actually um, approach it and address it more effectively without you know wasting everyone's time in the process. But another thing that I would recommend, um, something I've been paying attention to, is just watching leadership and how they respond. And so because we're a democracy still, as far as I know, um, looking at our overall leadership that's elected and going, not what their positioning is, but listening to the way that they talk about people and if they're humanizing people. And do they talk more about helping people or do they talk more about hurting people? Because if they're talking more about hurting people, they're already a lost cause and we got to get them out. Like, that's just the reality of it. Like, we are one planet we're one community um, and we have a lot of pain and suffering that we have to address and do something about in order for us to move forward uh, this is something that I've dug into too because in looking at it I've realized that it is an agricultural crisis and it is a environmental crisis and most of the great wisdom that I default to in the garden and beyond is from indigenous people like it's from black and indigenous people a lot of the gardening techniques and tips a lot of um you know working with nature rather than against like so many of these things are not mine they're just things that have been shared by other people over the years so um really kind of digging into all of that now if you still are feeling resistance to me expressing this message. Um, if you're like, you know, spitting mad and ready to just go off in the comments, I just would invite you to sit with that for a minute and ask yourself why you're feeling the resistance that you're feeling. Like, why are you feeling this anger? Because I really do think that it probably comes from a place of fear. And why are you feeling this place of fear is more than likely because uh, you feel like you might be giving up something in order for other people to get their fair share. But I think the reality is, is that most of us probably don't have much to give up. Um, and it's just more about sharing what we already have than giving up anything. And if you don't feel like we have enough, then we need to ask for more collectively. So I'm going to add some links here um, to kind of get you guys started on your journey if you're ready. Uh, there's a link to a playlist that I've been working on that features black and brown and indigenous and other people of color and culture, uh, farmers and gardeners who are just, you know, making their way here on YouTube. Some of them is documenting their stories and trials and tribulations, and some is their day-to-day -day on their farm or garden. And a lot of times they have a lot more budget-friendly tips even than I provide, so I definitely recommend and encourage you to check them out. Uh, one of the things that I've really noticed in watching um, all of these, learning more about all of these various people that I was not following before, um, and people who you know don't look like me and don't sound like me, which is just a really cool experience to be honest, to get that level of diversity. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed and that didn't jump out at me until I really actively started looking is that at the end of the day, we all basically have the same hopes and dreams and things we're trying to accomplish um, in life, in the garden. But the things that some people fear, they're so much more 
it's so much more than I would like ever even think about on my daily on a daily basis. <laughs> um, I can't imagine living with that level of fear like every day of my life. So I feel really compelled to speak up against it to help do something about it. I don't think that people should be oppressed based on um, how they look. It's not okay, especially if those people have a lot of the solutions that we're looking for in terms of continuing to feed the world amidst climate change and civil unrest and <laughs> health crisis and whatever else. So I invite you to come to the table with an open mind and open heart. Um, get to know some people that you did not know before. Figure out if there's ways that you can help provide you know, resources um, in some capacity and uh, basically turn your resistance into your resistance to new information uh, into the sort of resi resistance <laughs> that we actually need. So um, yeah, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Please make an effort to be kind in the comments. I am basically going to be making sure that if you're unkind there, you're going in the compost pile. Like that's just the way this is working. This is a space for us to learn together, grow together, and figure this stuff out together so we can get a plan of action to move forward collectively because we are stronger together. Um, again, the links and resources are also in the description below. If you are looking for more links and resources, I am sharing those things over on Instagram as well as the usual gardening stuff that I share there. You can find me there at Flavor Kit. And until I find another place to land soon, happy gardening.